I remember the first time, my first encounter with poetry was probably, I was like seven, and there was a, a book that I had read called something, I think it was Peter Porpoise and Susie Starfish. And it was like a, in fact, I, ha I, ha I had the co I had a cop that copy with me up until two years ago when it went into the library here at FSU. Um, and I had tried to write a poem based on the, the book, but I didn't think much of it. I was, I thought maybe I wanted to be a scientist when I was, I don't know where I got that idea. Microscopes, telescopes, you know, going to the moon, I don't know. But then um, around the time I was, I guess, 17, I got really interested in the, it was the 60s and the beat writers were very, very, strong and visible in pop culture at that time. Some friends who had friends who lived in New York came to, I lived, grew up in Miami, Miami Beach, and they had some uh, records of Howl by Allen Ginsberg and um, Coney Island of the Mind by Lawrence Ferlinghetti, and I remember listening to those and going, wow, this is very, very cool. And I had a teacher, in, who was teaching me the romantics uh, in schools. It, uh, she was teaching me uh, Keats and Shelley and Byron and Blake. And I thought, oh, that's very, very cool too. I thought, I want to be a poet. There was something very allied between the beats in the time and the, and the romantic poets. So it all kind of fed into one thing. So I decided like, I'm going to be a poet, 17, about 17. And um, I graduated from, from college at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and uh, with an English degree. And I didn't want to teach. I just, but I, something I learned also from the beat writers is that I was very interested in ecology because of the beat writers at the, at the time. And the beat writers were very interested in nature and uh, biology and science and art, archaeology. And they were very, very interested in a lot of things. And I thought to myself, well, why, you know, why do I need, I don't need to, I can do anything I want and be a poet. So actually, I, I opened, I went to California with my ex-wife at the time, wife at the time, and we opened up a tropical plant nursery in California, growing air plants, you know, bromeliads, the tropical plants, that, like Spanish moss, kind of stuff like that, with no background in horticulture or biology at all. Just, I can do it. Why not? So that's what I did for 25 years. I never worked in schools. I worked as a poet and running a tropical plant nursery. That's so great. I, awesome. I continued, huh? That's awesome. So that was my life. And so um, I felt that I was informing my, an interesting thing was, so I had this nursery called Shell Dance right there in, um, south of San Francisco, a little, t just right on the border of San Francisco. And all these beat writers who I had read when I was in high school, they heard about the nursery because it was unusual, it was an exotic nursery with very, and beat writers were very interested in that kind of thing. So these famous poets that I knew from my own readings, started showing up at the nursery. And I was like, hey, uh, this is really cool. Would you like to meet Michael McClure? I go like, Michael McClure? Would I? Yeah, I mean, he was a hero of mine. So but I'll bring him by next week. And Michael McClure would come by. And Philip Whalen came by. And Joanne Kiger came by. And they became my family. And they became my close friends. And we, our interests were around nature first and poetry was second 
it was important, but the bond was created over a love of the natural world rather than, did you get your poem published in X magazine? Did you get your book published by, no, no. We hardly, sometimes we never even talked about poetry at all. We talked about, oh, that's an interesting plant. How does it live without dirt? How does it live in a tree? Is it is Spanish moss really a moss or no? It's not. It's 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 a it's in the pineapple family. It has little flowers on it, and mosses don't have flowers. They have spores, and they're like, oh wow, yeah, this is very very interesting. So, so I became poetry became my life. Poetry and art and nature became my life, and that's how it kind of all evolved with Peter Porpoise and Susie Starfish. That's great. So, so ecology, you're really interested in nature. Um, are, like, are there other themes that you're interested in writing about with your poetry? And I became extremely active in, in, in the politics of ecology. Um, I mean, I started, you know, activist groups and headed up lawsuits against developers to prevent them from building on endangered habitats. And I mean, that's what I did. I did nature art you know art in general i mean i've always loved all the arts and painting and architecture and sculpture and music i mean nature all of it i mean i i, I felt that to me and nature you know subjects you know those are it's like life you know that's so uh, I would say probably those things informed my work. You know. So yeah. Um, love, great. love, love gets in there. Of course, God, gotta have you love. Can't, you can't get rid of it, damn it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's an essential. Um, and um, so like your FSU's like resident poet. Like, what exactly does that mean? Uh, what I am is so what I got here four years ago. And um, I, I had to get out of California. It's too expensive. I couldn't do it anymore. And I wanted to go someplace where I could afford and process of elimination. I don't know how I ended up in Tallahassee, really. But I ended up in Tallahassee. Um, I mean, I grew up in Florida, so I knew of Tallahassee. I remembered it being a pretty place. And uh, uh, my Terry, my wife, she, her mother lived in in Hollywood, Florida, and we were decided we needed to get her out of there, take care of her. She's old, and so we brought her here and ended up in Tallahassee. Now, and I had all of these, so I became I I, I had all these books and papers. See, I it I became um, so I was writing a lot, and I started a mag uh, an online magazine about 23 years ago, which is beginning of the internet type of literary thing. It was not much going on. And um, I became editor for some of the beat writers. And I ended up being caretaker for one particular poet, Philip Whalen, who was one of the central beat poets, um, Kerouac and Ginsburg and so forth. And so, I had, my life was, I had a lot of stuff from all of that. I kept everything, including Peter the Porpoise and Sally Starfish and books that people gave me, letters that people wrote to me. Just, I had over 60 boxes of things like that. And I got in contact with the library here and I asked them if they'd be interested in having my archives. And I didn't really think they would be because I thought, well, what does Tallahassee need with the beatnik? You know, a little second generation beatnik guy. And they were like, oh, that sounds very interesting. Let's see. So they came here and they spent many hours going through all of my papers and decided that they did want them to be part of the library. And so they made an acquisition of the, everything of my papers, childhood, adult, all my contact communications with people. Yeah. And um, 
they asked me if I would wanted to be a poet in residence of the FSU libraries, which I thought was kind of cool. I mean, I just got here in town and I didn't know anybody. I I hadn't for the most of my life I didn't really look to establish myself in the university system, and I never really sought awards or honorary positions and things like that. I mean, it just never. I never had the, the uh, I don't know what it is, patience. Patience is a nice way to put it. And I uh, never had the patience. But I thought, this is very nice. These people are nice and they care about what I'm doing. Yes, I'd like to do that. That would be really wonderful. Thank you very much. So I became FSU Libraries Poet in Residence. So it's a position appointed through the library system at FSU. So I'm not part of the, um, I'm not employed by the university. I'm, it's the libraries that I'm an honorary, I'm an honorary something or other. Do you have to do anything like as with that title or do you just like have it? Just hang out, get high, no, 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 no. What, what I do is, um, well, I helped, I helped uh, coordinate and organize a uh, exhibition that they did uh, last year for the uh, on um, pro poetry and protest. And there at the Strozier, there was a great. They took things from my collection of stuff and things they had in the archives, their library already, uh, books of by poets who were known for their, you know nature poetry, environmental work, you know, books about, about um, racial injustice and, you know, political activism and, you know, obscenity trials and things like that, things that were, showed the role of poets and writers in this reality of, of um, of engagement of poetry, po and, you know, political poetry and poetry project. It has a big tradition. So I got to participate in that and help them suggest what things were in my archives that might be cool to, sh to add to it. And but what books I had and what books I, I had published or poems that I'd written or what poets and other people who would be perfect for it based on their their life's work. So that I got to do that. That was great. I, you know, I love that. They also have me archiving, documenting my archives. Like they send me pic pictures of, right now they're sending me pictures. Before I used to go in the library and they would send me photos of things that were in my papers and ask me to give them a description of what those things are, you know, like what a letter. Who's that person? What? Why did? Why did they write you that letter? What was it about? What, you know, things like that. So helping to develop the history and uh, behind the archives. That's something I'm doing. Um, hopefully, I'll help to do a um, exhibition on Philip Whalen, who's that poet I told you that I was. I told you about his, he was, I was his, his editor and caretaker, mm -hmm. took care of him to his death. So I have some things here in the library now that are very, very amazing. Like his robes, from, he became a Buddhist monk. Things, personal things that he has, it's like a great history of who he was as a human being are now in the library now. And, and um, so I hope I get to help them with that. And uh, I did. Uh, I I created a project called uh, "Read a Poem to a Child," which was um, because of my son's death. Um, people were asking me, "Well, what do you want to do about 100,000 poets for change this year?" And I said, "Well, how about we just read a poem to a child? Like that should be possible." And uh, thinking to myself, I didn't tell people that's why I thought of it. 
because of my son. I just, because I didn't want that to become a big issue. But I told them that um, I think that it's a good way to go. So a lot of people started to do this read a poem to a child program. And when I initiated that, by coincidence, the FSU Library has a collection of nearly, I think it's 50,000 volumes of poetry and books of childhood that is part that's in their archives. Mm -hmm. And they're like, well, wait, this is like, what you're doing is great for us. How about we partner on that? So we work together on spreading the word about the Read a Poem Child program in Tallahassee and abroad and throughout the country. Um, the first year we had something like 60 classrooms in Tallahassee with where they read poems to children, poets from the school. University went into the, to the local schools and read, talked about poetry. And um, so we have that in common. So we work together in projects. So we work together in projects. And that's, that's does that, that answers the question, right? It's like, what do you do? It's we've divided, it, we had a lot in common. And so we found a lot of things that we could do to support each other's work. And uh, they're great. They're such good people. It's a very cool life. They're nice people. And it's a great library. They have some amazing things. It's like if you say, well, what's your favorite subject? What, do you have a subject that you like? Me? Yeah. I like, I mean, what, like, what do you mean? I mean, like, like what's anything? a, besides love, pick a subject. Oh, that I like to write about? Or, yeah, or you like to think about. Oh, I have so many. I don't I mean music. I like music and the way like it interacts, like what it means to people. That's interesting. The culture. I, there's so many that I am like interested in. Music. Yeah. That's very interesting to me. It is. Because I told you about that book that I was working on for many years. It's about music. It's the name of the book is called The Drums of Grace. And it's about music and the importance of music in culture set in a dystopian world. Ooh, I might check that out. Yeah, that sounds pretty fun. Well, if you want, I can, I have, it's not published yet, but I have it in a, in a Word doc. I could always forward you an attachment. And you're welcome to awesome. Are you, are you thinking about publishing it or like sending yeah, it? Yeah, it's just happened that the completion of it is about, was recently. So I haven't really gotten out to, I mean, I sent it. I sent out a copy today. I thought it was pretty funny. To here, I am. Like, if you would have said to me twenty years ago when I started the project, if you said, "Michael, the day when the, when you finally go out to send this up to New York to an agent, you are going to be wearing a mask and gloves during a global pandemic, and you'll be delivering this book to the UPS." to ship it there. And like, there I am, like going into the UPS store with gloves and a mask on saying, my book, send it to New York, you know. <laughs> it's like, no, 20 years ago, I would have thought that that was maybe a chapter in the book, but not the, not the reality of it. So. Yeah, I'm saying, like if you told me that like, I'd be graduating in the middle of like a pandemic, I'd be like, no way, that's not happening. No, it's like hard to even understand what a pandemic is. Is this yeah. like really, is this really happening or are we just pretending? Mm -hmm. you know? I think it'll be interesting to see how this like influences writing, like maybe your writing and like everyone's writing. Cause I think it's just such a big deal. Just such a game changer. It is. It's hard to like look at life before the same way, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's going to, yeah, I think you're right. I think that it can, certainly it's going to generate poetry about it, mm -hmm. which that's important. But I think that's almost even more important is how it, in, how it affects the perspective of the world and how people see life. It's like, it's a paradigm shift, right? It's, we, it's a shift in per paradigm, how we look at life, how we look at the world, how we look at each other. Forget about the, I mean, I mean, you know what I mean? It's like this, 
you do this new new it'll be interesting to see does poetry take on a different tone even when it's talking about love does it take on a different tone because we we've been through this we're going through this like post war like post world war 2 literature there's a it affected the way the, the the areas of attention of people after world war 1 it it changed how people looked at the world not just that they wrote about the war but how they viewed the world and their own existence their own you know that shifted i think we'll be through that i think you're right yeah um let me see let me see what one of my questions are um but yeah do you have like um like what do you think makes a good poem like what separates a good poem versus a bad poem or is there anything is there such a thing as a good one and a bad one i'm glad you asked you added that last part <laughs> to, the, to the question is there any such thing you know i mean the more the more you know the less you know that's kind of i believe that and it's it's like it's, how did it go it's like when you know you don't know you finally knowing something or there's another one which i don't think I want to use that but um, opinions are like assholes everybody has one mm -hmm. we you know i mean nobody really knows what's going to play out historically about it as great poetry or not good poet i mean it's just you know things one day something seems great next time it seems terrible and then the day after that it seems great again sometimes you you can't stand a person's personality and you hate their poetry and then you become best friends and all of a sudden you decide their poetry is the best thing ever made per perspective personal emotional response so much um, influences what our judgment on things all i can all i can think of is that it's really important and i don't know whether it makes good poetry or bad poetry but it i think it's important to be authentic to yourself and your own voice and to don't be afraid that you're not going to make it or not get included or not going to win that you know poetry and capitalism don't mix real well so it's kind of like but you know there's been some great capitalist poets so <laughs> i don't know i don't know i have very very eclectic personal taste in poetry i like all kinds of poetry poetry i like poetry some poetry that comes out of the university system academic stuff i like poetry that comes out of the beat generation and the underground i like some hip hop poetry and slam poetry and spoken word poetry and um so i just it's just whether it hits me or not that but in terms of, of a, an objective judgment i'm not selling it so i don't need to come up with an objective to know you know great answer seriously great answer <laughs> um like in one sentence what do you think like why does poetry matter to you like what do you think in one sentence it can be two if you want you know you know the sentence the question comes out of a, actually is very tied it's tied to a big debate a big debate um there is a statement by Auden about like oh i wish i i could had i could find it it's in the poem william uh 
uh, in memory of William Butler Yeats. It's a good poem, a really good poem. You should read it. Um, and great, it's great writing. And it, there's a statement in there about uh, poetry makes nothing happen or something like that. And, um, but it's not, I don't believe that's what he's really saying. I think it's more complicated than that, but poetry matters because it's because it gives us access to our to a, a part of ourselves that we need to know. It 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 enables us to communicate things that need to be communicated between people that may not be it's kind of like I was saying about art. It's like painting. It's like there's a vocabulary of painting. There's, a, there's an imagery of things that comes through painting that cannot be communicated through words. Poetry, some things that in fiction can't communicate that comes across in poetry. It's just, and matter, like, what does that mean? Like, I mean, like, does it, can you build, does it change the world? Will it make you rich? Does it, does it matter? Does life matter? I mean, you know, poetry is breath. Poetry is everything we are in our, our being. Just all art is like that. So, you know, it's, that's, it's a, why does it matter? I'll tell, I know why it matters because I would never have met you if I had never wasn't a poet. That's, the, that's an awesome answer. Wait. <laughs> I like how you took the existential route to um, that question. I always like seeing how people react. Like, what, what is, does anything matter? It's yeah. like, yes and no. <laughs> oh. You know, it's like, well, people say, you know, like, well, when you say 100,000 poets for change, he's, what is it going to change? I say, well, I did lay out in the basic mission that it's it has to have to do with peace justice and sustainability so i'm not talking about like fascism i'm not talking about promoting a change through global destruction <laughs> i'm talking about within these this framework of peace justice and sustainability that's now how does it change things do in sustainability well again 700 groups around the world are communicating about the issues of their life. We are, none of us walked away from that experience the same. We have, we know each other now. Our lives have been rich, made richer. Our awareness is broader. We know more about other countries and other means of expression and personal concern. So I think that's changed. That's changed. We didn't have that before. Poetry, made that happen so that's great yeah <laughs> i don't have anything to say i think you've answered most of my questions honestly i think the last question i have is just um will you read one of your poems sure sure yes i i will um the, the poem i have for you is about um I, that I, it comes out of a book that i wrote for my son called Walking in Air. And um, this is called God Should Fix a Broken World. God should fix a broken world if there is such a thing as God. So many cruel and bloody pieces the center does not hold. My mother used to say, God is an underachiever. But I would guess God is blessed with attention deficit disorder. He or she, too easily confused by the tasks of administration. God should fix a broken world but everyone is in the temple now, converting dollars to pesos, tossing dice, and all the gods, the one in many, are too pissed off by wrong and right. 
nothing will ever get done. Oh, gods and goddesses of the world, unite, forget your spite. You've got a job to do. You spread yourselves too thin to make things right. Gods should work together day and night so a child will never fall again through the cracks of life. Any supreme being worth their weight in angels should heal us of addiction, feed the poor, shelter the homeless, cure us of disease and bloodlust, stop the bombings, dissolve the paradigm of master and slave, repair the obvious things, deliver the children from torture, and never ever let them claw the walls until their hearts are broken. God should fix the broken world, not lead us into a nightmare of fire and ice so we can prove our faith, hand us trials and tribulations. What kind of God is this? A narcissist. Put an end to hate. Make a better humankind if you're so great. We have witnessed enough. God should fix a broken world or step aside for the little boys and girls if there is a God. This God of pride has shown us the worst. Step aside and let us see the possibilities. Let us see what an unencumbered human being is capable of, free of heaven and hell. Whoa. <laughs> You did such a good job, like, um, performing it as well. Because I know some poets aren't good at performing, but you were really good at performing that. Thank you. You, um, actually, uh, I'll send you a link. There's a link of me reading this at the 621 with uh, John Pazder, who's guitarist, keyboardist, and synth guy. And uh, it was filmed by Ian Weir, who teaches, um, teaches, uh, videography at FSU. I think it came out really cool. It's very strange. The sound yeah. it's, it's very intense. I'll give you the link of it. You'll I think you'll like it. Um, and also, I just read did performed it with um, uh, a, 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 we recorded a CD of of I like see I like to perform with musicians. I, performance is a big part of poetry for me. It's um, it's something I learned from the beat writers, and it's something I think is really really important. Um, so I, for many many years, I've been performing with bands, anywhere from jazz bands to psychedelic rock bands to uh, you know classical stuff. So. Uh, and I've done performances around Tallahassee with a group called, that I put together called the Eco Sound Ensemble. And uh, we performed at the Moon. We performed for War to South, and I performed at Black Dog and and um, different places around town. And uh, I performed around the country. And um, so, yeah, that's a big deal for me. So we just finished a CD with Longinu Parsons uh, from FAMU. It's amazing uh, trumpet player, a horn player. He's like great. Michael Backen, who teaches um, world, who's the head of the world music department at FSU, who's also an amazing drummer percussionist, and Brian Hall, who's a great bass player, teaches at FAMU as well. Um, so it's a great combo that we recorded um, a CD just before this virus came and we finished it up called dystopic relapse and it includes a uh, god should fix a broken world and some other poem from one of the poems from that book walking on air and um i um i and so i'll send you the link of the it it's it's a um, I think it's something that poets, I like when poets work with their, with their, with bands and music. It's the best, most fun for me. I mean, if you said, you know, said to me, like, if you want to do a reading, I'd go, well, is there going to be a band? It's like, it's a blast. It's music. Like you're saying about music. It's like music and the relationship with poetry 
and the de- how it delivers, it's 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 really powerful magic thing. 